I am in an ongoing war against weeds at my house. It is crazy. Uh, at our house, it's, we have kind of an unusual backyard. The backyard has a super steep hill. It's about a 60-degree incline, so it's hard to even walk on it, much less do weeding and stuff like that. So I really work hard to eliminate the weeds up there. And so I got a, a picture to show you of how it looks with zero weeds. I took a picture this morning. It's so great. And here's the process. When, when, we, when weeds do come up, I grab every one of those little buggers out, just little, little teeny ones or big ones, by the roots. I try to get as much root out as possible so there are no weeds on the hill. But then this next step is super important. I apply what's a chemical called a pre-emergent. The one I use is casserole. And what it does, it doesn't kill weeds. It prevents them from being born. It's a pre-emergent. Before they even come up, it, it, it creates a little gas along, the, along the, uh, the surface of the dirt so weeds can't even begin. They cannot even begin their life on my hill. Sorry, weeds. Not today. <laughs> now, in the front yard, it's so much easier access. It's all flat. Like, oh, whatever. And so, like, the last time that I weeded, I, I did weed, but I, I kind of ran out of casserole early. And so I was like, oh, it's not, it's not that big a deal. It's just a front yard. <laughs> well, now I want to show you a picture of what the front yard looks like now, today, this morning. Because I did not apply that pre-emergent, now I've got a really big problem on my hands that, like the back hill, I just walk out, done. The front yard, now I need to get down on my hands and knees, once again, pull every single weed out, uh, and then to apply a pre-emergent, or else what's going to happen, I don't know if you know this, there are cold weather weeds and warm weather weeds, so the warm ones just started coming up, and it's just going to keep coming back unless I take care of them ahead of time. So here's the point. Prevention is the key. Prevention is the key. Would you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30? And we are continuing on in our, our mini-series uh, called Next Level Relationships. And I love the message that Pastor Christian brought last Sunday. Oh, my goodness, what a great message that changed me personally. Uh, and I hope it's changing you, too. And one of the things that he talked about is that next-level relationships come from next-level righteousness. And, and Jesus talked about that next level righteousness. He said, I'm calling you, my followers, to righteous living that is on a better level, a higher plane than the Pharisees of Jesus' day. So those religious leaders that were supposed to be everyone's examples, they were not doing it. And the, and the issue was they were obeying the letter of the law, so like the law of Moses, the law of God. They were obeying the letter. Like, whatever it said, I'm going to do exactly that. But they were missing the spirit of the law. They, were, they were, had totally disregarded what did God mean by that? What was he trying to accomplish in us with those laws? So Matthew 5, 27, Jesus continues on. And he says, you have heard the commandment. So he's referring to the law. You've heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. So you might have learned it this way, thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus affirms this commandment. Like he's, he's not coming and saying the law is no longer here. He's, he affirms that, like that's good. That is the commandment of God. But Jesus came to show us and to accomplish the purpose of the law. Why did God write down that sort of stark, severe sounding commandment? You shall not commit adultery. Why, what was his purpose? Well, Jesus came to show us that God's purpose is next-level relationships. He, he came to show us how and to teach us with his words how to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and how to love your neighbor, others around you, as yourself. So Jesus came to show us the, the whole thing we've been talking about here, this thousands of years, all that Moses on the mountain, all that stuff, the whole thing boils down to this, how to love God with everything you got and how to love yourself and love the other people in your life. It's all about loving relationships. That's the purpose. Now, when the Pharisees heard this command 
uh, they, they, would have, they would have run it through some filters. And Jesus goes on and he says, verse 28, but I say, so Jesus said, you've heard the law, you shall not commit adultery, but I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So that concept of sinning in your heart, that was not new to the Jewish people. But Jesus steps it up and says, it's an equal sin. So the Pharisees would have said, hey, I've never gone to bed with a, a woman who, who I'm not married to. So I'm good. I've completed the law. I've obeyed. What they did was the minimum because that allowed a lot of room for other stuff that was inappropriate to go on. And Jesus is, is helping us to realize your heart matters to God. Your heart. Not just saying, well, I've never done that bad thing. That, that's not the issue. It's your heart and your relationship with God. In, in, uh, in another place in Matthew 15, 19 to 20, Jesus said, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. It's not just doing bad stuff. It's doing it in your heart. It is what is your intent. Lust is wrong, whether it occurs in a female or a male. But in this passage, guys, he's talking to you. It's pretty clear. His example was, if anyone looks at a woman with lust, he's talking to the guys. So guys, Jesus calls you to accountability for this. And there's no blaming the woman. It's not my fault. She was too attractive. No. No. Jesus calls you and me to, be, to accountability. And he expects you to take responsibility to control your desires. Men can get in the habit of searching online or even searching in real life for something attractive, someone attractive to stare at. And you might think, well, what's the harm? I mean, just looking, just thinking. I didn't do anything. It didn't hurt anybody. But Jesus says, you have allowed yourself to become defiled. That's like a temple with something unholy in it. That's defiled. Or a dirty dish. That's defiled. You would not eat on a dirty dish. It's defiled. And Jesus said, these things in your heart defile you. And he made it very clear here. Immorality begins in the heart. I've got good news for you. Because purity begins in the heart, too. Purity. I initially titled my message, I don't always even tell you the title, but it's just kind of there for me and for my record. I initially titled this message, Lust. But then halfway through my study, I changed the title to Purity. And I would rather have us be focused on purity than focused on lust. Let's focus on purity. So Jesus goes on. He said, you've heard the commandment. You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if, if, if anyone even looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. And Jesus goes on, verse 29. So if your eye, even your good eye, your best one, like you know, your favorite one, your strongest one, <laughs> causes you to lust, if even your eye causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, the original was even your right hand, but we know you might be right or left-handed. Even your stronger hand causes you to sin. Cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body 
to be thrown into hell. So Jesus holds you and me responsible for protecting your eyes from things that cause you to lust. Jesus holds you and me responsible for protecting your eyes from things that cause you to lust. Guess what the bottom line is? Prevention is key. Prevention is key. Jesus exaggerates the cure. He did this in the passage that we we talked about last week as well. He exaggerates the cure to drive home the seriousness of the sin. So like last week, uh, uh, Pastor Christian talked about how uh, if, if you're at worship, drop everything and run and be reconciled. Jesus is, is he's trying to say, this is really serious. <laughs> and in, in this week, he says, gouge out your eye. Cut off your hand. Listen, you guys, l- hear me. Don't take that literally. There have been well-meaning people who have, but here's the problem. Jesus knows even if you cut off your right hand, that did not change anything here. What he's saying is ruthlessly prevent. That's what he's saying. So do not literally mutilate your body. Do not mutilate your body. So do avoid veering off the path of righteousness and following the path that leads to destruction. Do avoid that. Do avoid veering off the path. Jesus says, eliminate what tempts you to gaze on what prompts you to lust. Eliminate what tempts you to gaze on what prompts you to lust. Why is this looking thing so important? Well, in James 1.14, Jesus' brother, his little bro, wrote, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And what you see here is such a clear, uh, poetic, poetically written, uh, visually written progression. There's a progression. And Jesus is trying to get at that progression because it starts with what's on the inside of us. It doesn't start with going to bed with someone you're not married to. That's not where it starts. It starts on the inside of you. It starts on the inside of us. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us. And those desires give birth to sinful actions. So then you, when you act on those things, you look at that thing, you get close to that person. When, when you act on that and you do sinful actions, those germinate death. Just like weeds are germinated. Those sinful actions lead to you dying on the inside. The very first people God created, Adam and Eve, did not understand this. I think the devil did understand it, and he used it to to distract them. God said, if you I, I'm drawing a boundary here. Do not eat the fruit of this tree because if you do, you will die. That's what God said. The devil said, you won't die. That doesn't give birth to death. But God knew that desire, that, that lust, that leads to a simple action, disobeying, eating the fruit God said not to, he knew that that would lead birth to, it would give birth to death. Prior to that, humans would have lived forever in the presence of the Lord. You would never have died. No death. There was no death then. But that sinful action gave birth to death. Now the devil said, I was right, you didn't die. And they did die. (laughs) Their purity died. Their relationship with God died. Shame came in. And then eventually their body caught up to that and died. Adam and Eve still not here today. They did die. God did tell the truth. Sinful actions give birth to death. God 
doesn't want you to die or be dead on the inside. He wants you alive, alive to Christ, alive in him. And he wants you to have eternal life. That's what God wants. So Jesus is not here saying, I'm here to, ki- to be a killjoy. I'm here to take away all your fun. Because he knows where that fun leads. And he doesn't want you to die inside. He doesn't even want you to die outside. It's part of our broken world. We have eternal life that starts now. Praise the Lord. We're going to continue, even after we, our body dies, we're going to continue eternal life with Jesus forever. Praise his name. That's what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to die. I'm going to say something here. Let just, just think about this for a minute. Sexual arousal is plain and simply the anticipation of sexual pleasure. Sexual arousal is plain and simply the anticipation of sexual pleasure. And guys, we tend to compartmentalize and say, no, this is not connected to that. It is. It is connected to that. Now, I want to just bring something positive here. Sex is God's idea for us. He doesn't have sex. He created it as a gift for us, for humanity. And biblically, if you look at what the Bible has to say on this topic, there's, there's two really great reasons for sex, procreation and pleasure. God came up with a really good gift. It keeps the human, uh, human, humanity reproducing and, and going on, and it, it gives pleasure. It's a great gift. But just like with all of God's gifts, they can be taken to excess, and excess leads to ruin. Think of all of the other gifts, money, food, just just all the different things, relationships, all these gifts, they can be misused or abused or taken to excess. Only within God's boundaries is their health. That's where the health is. It's a good gift. And it's healthy and fulfilling to enjoy the beauty of your spouse. That's where it thrives. That's where this whole thing thrives. And that's what God gave you, your spouse. Uh, That's one of the reasons why God gave you your spouse. It's a gift. But when you stare at others and become aroused by them, then it becomes unhealthy for you. That's That's the line. So God gives us this good gift. Satan created porn as a counterfeit to explore your desire for love, to exploit your desire for love and trip you up. So God gives us this good gift. Satan says, I'm going to counterfeit that gift, counterfeit that money with something that's actually going to hurt you, something that was meant for good. I'm going to turn it, twist it, pervert it, and make it so it's going to hurt you. So porn feels good for a moment or else no one would do it. And millions of people are, are participating in porn. So it does feel good. No one is denying that for a moment. But porn leads to anger. Think about that for a minute. Anger at your spouse if you're married. Anger at yourself. Porn leads to anger. It, it leads to emptiness because you're searching for love, but you will never find it there. It is a one-way street. No love's coming back at you. Love satisfies. Lust depletes. It empties you. Love fills you. It's a gift from God. Lust depletes you. It leaves you feeling empty. You just well, you keep trying to, to fill it with the same thing, and you just get emptier and emptier. Simon Blackburn wrote, Love receives the world's applause. Just think about that. Wedding different things. Love receives the world's applause. Lust is hidden, ashamed, and embarrassed. Love pursues the good of the other with self-control, concern, reason, and patience. Lust pursues its own gratification, headlong, impatient of any control, immune to reason. Jesus said, it's better, it'd be better to pluck out your eye 
and have your whole body thrown into the fires of hell. Well, listen, it's not so much that one lustful look sends you straight to hell, bam. Well, I guess that's it. One lustful look, everyone's in hell because we would all be in hell right now. Let the one with, with no sin among you throw the first stone. Like we would all be gone to hell right now. So that's not really the point that Jesus is saying. But if you live a life of intentional sin, you're not following Jesus. In 1 John, one of Jesus' disciples wrote, 1 John 3, 9, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they're children of God. I, I wanted to be very careful, and I've prayed about this, to not give you the impression, because I'm the preacher, and I'm bringing a strong word from Jesus, that I have got it all together. So I, I want you to know that I am a fellow struggler. And when I read that verse, that people who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning, I just go, oh, my goodness, how many times have I asked for forgiveness? Have I crossed that line? But I love the, that phrase, the way it's translated in the NLT, make it a practice. My practice is not to go sin. I, I fight against it, I struggle against it, I pray, I pray. And we'll talk about some other things a little bit later that, in this message that we do. That is not my practice. And that really is a very different stance than the world that says, this is my practice. This is what I do. This is what I enjoy. This is, it's Friday night. I'm, I'm gone. That is, that is not our practice. And I want you to know, if you're following Jesus to the best of your ability, and you've been stumbling you are not out. You're just struggling. And we're going to talk about some very practical ways to prevent that in just a few moments. I, I want you to know from Jesus' words when he said that it's better to, to not get your whole body cast into hell, there is a judgment coming. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged, all. All of us, myself included, must stand before Christ to be judged. There is coming a judgment day. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Would you just picture that day right now? Would you picture you standing before Jesus? You, Christian, follower of Jesus. You, seeker, maybe you haven't even given your life to Jesus yet. Would you picture yourself standing before Jesus on Judgment Day? There, there was another verse that I just, I, I just couldn't bring all the verses in. There's another one that talks about what are you, how are you building your life? Are you building with gold, silver, and precious stones? Are you building with wood, hay, and straw? What are, you, what are you building your life with? And in that verse when it says the fire is going to come on Judgment Day and all the stuff that wasn't for God is going to get burned up in your life, it, it says you're going to be saved, but it's not going to be a good day for you. Oh, I think that we need to think about that a little bit. There is coming a day when you're going to stand before Jesus, when I'm going to stand before Jesus. And I don't know how it's going to work, but uh, it, it says in Revelation that books will be opened and read. So is the whole world going to hear everything that you did ever in your life in an instant? I don't know. I don't know how that's going to look. I don't know how it's going to work. But then there's another book, the book of life. And no matter what other stuff you did, no matter what was burned up, no matter even the struggles, if your faith was in Jesus, you kept coming back to Jesus, you kept repenting, you keep following him, and your name's in the Lamb's book of life, despite all of that, heaven is yours. 
but there's going to be one really squirmy day. No, no, really, really squirmy. <laughs> Not a little awkward, <laughs> really. So what must we do? Take responsibility for your own purity. There you go. Take responsibility for your own purity. No one else. Take responsibility for your own purity. Prevention is key. In Mark 14, 38, Jesus told his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. There's so much. That could be a sermon series on just that one verse on theology of the body and the spirit and, and praying and watching. Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. Now hear me on this. We Christians are very good at praying, but we're not very good at watching. And I'm saying we. So we pray, Lord, take away the lust, take away the temptation, take away the sin. Help me to not even want to do that ever again. We, that's what we pray. And then we go, we gaze on things that cause our, ourselves to lust, and then we lust, and maybe even worse, and then we come back and we pray. We prayed, but we didn't watch. And which one comes first? Watch. So you might be really super frustrated because you have prayed for years. I have prayed for years that God would take away this lust, and God didn't do it because you didn't watch. You are responsible for protecting your eyes from seeing the stuff that prompts you to lust. You put down that device. You. It doesn't matter if you prayed. If you didn't put down the device, it doesn't matter. God's not going to keep you from lust if you're looking at porn. Watch and pray. It's both. So don't blame it on God if you prayed a million times and stumbled a million times. He wants to empower you. He wants to help you. And we're going to talk about some very practical things tonight. First, first one is this. Clean up your life. In other words, do the weeding. Do the weeding. If I hadn't weeded, it wouldn't have even done any good to put on castor oil because the weeds are just sprouting and dropping seeds. All, it's just, it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have done any good. So first, clean up your life. Take an honest look at what you look at. Assess your thoughts and fantasies. You might think, well, it's, I don't, it's not very often. Would you stop and just assess? How are you doing, really? How many times today? Has your thoughts gone somewhere they shouldn't have gone? So pull those weeds. Get rid of the stuff. Get rid of the evil stuff that you've allowed in your life. Pull weeds through repentance. Repentance is where I talk about this every Sunday at the end of my message. It's where you turn away from your sin. You do a 180 and you turn to God. That's repentance. You change your mind about that activity. You repent. You say, I'm leaving that and I'm giving my life to you, Lord. Uh, clean, up, clean up your life through purging materials. What do you have laying around? And you know what, you know, there is a million workarounds. So what do you got laying around that you need to clean up and eliminate? Uh, pull the weeds through breaking ties. So what coworker do you think about when you're choosing your clothes for the day? What schoolmate do you think about when you think about what am I going to wear? What ties do you have with a certain person, even whether or not they know? And what ties do you have with a person because there's a tie with that person? Something physical has happened with, some, with someone that you're not married to. That's what we're talking about, someone you're not married to. Uh, pull the weeds through counseling. If you need help, man, get a mentor. Get a counselor. Get a Christian counselor. Because uh, the goal of counseling a lot of times is to make you feel comfortable with your choices. <laughs> That's why I say get a Christian one. <laughs> Tries to help you be comfortable with God's choices. <laughs> that's, a better, that's a better way to go. <laughs> uh, and then deliverance. Deliverance. I'm working on something. I'm hoping for this spring for a, just a, an event where, where we really get and we, we tackle this as Christians and we close the doors that we have opened to the enemy. Okay, so first thing, you got to do the weeding. Clean up your life. Second thing, prevent more exposure. Prevent more exposure. That's the casserole. Preventative, pre-emergent. Uh, in the front yard, I weeded, but I didn't prioritize 
prevention. And so the weeds are all back. And now I got to work way harder again to pull all those weeds. And it's just like that in our lives. You've got to take preventative action. It's not enough just to pray and repent. You need to prevent seeing more or being in those situations with actual people where you know you're going to be prompted to less. So here's some very practical suggestions. Get an accountability partner. Get an accountability partner. Someone that you can be honest with and someone that is a Christian that is going to hold you accountable and say, we agree, that's not right, right? That's sin. That's not following Jesus, right? Let's pray. Next week, what are you going to do that's different? That's what an accountability partner is. Second thing, in the same area, take preventive action. Get an accountability app. I have one on all my devices. It's the, the app Accountable to You. Accountable to You. And there are different apps out there. I like this one because you can have real-time alerts. So if you, set, if you choose to set up an accountability partner, you can choose to have them get a text and an email at the moment you look at something or even search. Talk about jarring when you secretly go to search and you get a phone call. What are you doing right now? <laughs> so this is what I would like to do, NFC. I want to get a group plan going on accountability to you. On accountable, I think it's accountable to you. Accountable to you. Um, and uh, I would be that, I think there are different levels. I think I, they call me the advocate. So I would not see what you would do, where you search. Only a person that you would choose to be your accountability partner, which I'm volunteering. It could be me or it could be another guy. Uh, but I would love it if every single guy, so say 100 guys of NFC, would get in on the group plan. Unless you've already got something, an, another accountability app, this is probably the best preventative passer on there is when it comes to this because you know the second you start, you're going to get a call 24-7. What are you doing right now? That'll prevent you. <laughs> so many of you have my cell number. Text me right now. Text me anytime today and say, I want in on that plan. And so once I get it going, I'll, I'm sure I'll send you a link or however, however, however we do that. Um, if you're online, this is really cool. You can be part. So text me if you got my, if you got my cell number. Uh, for everybody, you can go on our website. Here's the spoiler alert. Go to the Meet the Team page, you know, the Meet the Staff page. Right below my picture is a link that's my name. Click on it, and you're emailing me right there. So literally everybody has access to me. I am, I am accessible. So just send me an email and say, I want in on that group plan, and let's do it together, and, and let's prevent. So now I, I've got something else I want to do, and uh, this is a little, a little different, but I'm thinking about prevention, and I'm thinking about your kids. Man, let's not wait till they're full of weeds and then start weeding, okay? Let's do a preventative Let's prevent. And so there's something that, that uh, I did. Uh, I'll say we, but it's, it's the same gender parent. So I did with both of my sons, Stephen and Jared, called Passport to Purity. It's been, it's, a, it's a, an overnight experience that's all planned out for you. And it just tells you how to take your child uh, uh, and talk to them about biblical purity before it's an issue. It's a preventative. Oh my goodness, we still even, every so often, we'll, we'll mention something from Passport to Purity. Remember the balloon thing? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I am for you. Passport to Purity is intended for, uh, for you to take your approximately 11-year-old child. So if you have a child who is uh, maybe nearing that age, just a little younger, or is a little older, I want to give... Uh, two families today, Passport to Purity. Uh, if, if you're interested, can I just see your hand? Stay up there, you guys. I saw you. All right, so, and th this means that you would have someone in that category. Okay, so I saw, I didn't know how many, and I didn't want to waste money. I'm going to make sure every one of you guys get one. 
Okay, so the, the first people I saw were you guys and you guys. I'm going to give those to you. You're welcome. And then after the service, or whenever, come talk to me, uh, the, the other ones. And I saw at least two more. Maybe there's more. It's that important that we're going to take our collective resources and make sure you are resourced for this. Uh, when you look at it, you might get intimidated because it's involved. But I want you to know uh, that they, they, they know that. And so they have actually prepared. You can buy the kit that has all the, the crafts, the materials already done for you. Object lessons. Yes, more, that's, that's the word I'm looking for. Object lessons already gathered for you. So that's, that's there. It, or you can just gather them like, like we did. We just went to the dollar store and did them ourselves. Um, so we're going to help our kids to not even have to pull the weed and help them to prevent so much better, so much better. Okay, so clean up your life, do the weeding. Number two, prevent more exposure, put on that pre-emergent preventative. And number three, fill yourself with godly input. Fill yourself with godly input. That's like putting fertilizer on the flowers or on the grass. Fill your life, fill yourself with godly input. In the yard, you feed the plants or the grass that you want to grow. So in your life, feed the thoughts and actions that you want to increase in your life. You guys, some of us take church attendance so casually. Eh, if I feel like it, maybe I will, maybe I won't, maybe I'll go late, maybe I'll miss worship, maybe I'll just come in for the message. We treat it so casually when, in fact, we should treat it like a lifeline. It is a spiritual lifeline. You are putting something good in. You can't just get rid of the bad. You've also got to get good in so that your automatic response is, let's pray. Or, I know a worship song that will get me through this moment. Like, that's, that's what you want. Put, fill yourself with the stuff that you want to grow in your life. Don't treat it casually. This is too important for that. The devil's out there working 24-7. What are you doing to protect yourself? Connect groups. Again, you, as, as helpful and important as church, like coming to a, a, a worship service, you're hearing the word taught to you. I hope this is very practical for somebody. Uh, that's good. You're putting that in. But connect groups are where you actually look someone in the eye and they see that you're there or you're not. And they say, hey, I, I prayed for you last week. We uh, we, we've got guys, that, uh, people go, going in for surgery. Man, we prayed them through it because of Connect Group. Man, that's what you want to be in an atmosphere and an environment where people are praying for you. And don't get me wrong, Connect Groups, it's not so much like uh, people aren't really confessing stuff. They're asking for prayer. And so that's how we, we kind of, that's one of the ways we get to know each other during the Connect Group is people are saying, I'm, I'm concerned about this. My, I've had this issue at work. Or I've, I've got a surgery or whatever. So we get that, that's how, it's not like, People are sharing their deepest, darkest secrets. But sometimes they do. Sometimes we break up in smaller groups and, and people will share that stuff. That is awesome. A connect group is a great place to find an accountability partner. That's a great place to find that. Fill yourself with the Bible. We, we've given out devotionals. We have a Bible reading plan on our app. Like we, we just want to try to make it as easy for you as possible. Bite-sized chunks, sometimes less than a chapter a day, seven verses a day recently we've been doing with the, and then a devotional and fill yourself with that uh, fill yourself with prayer pray on your own not just once a week but on your own fill yourself with the worship music I, I, I said I think la, a, a couple weeks ago I, I mentioned that I have been watching uh, YouTube videos of worship and so cool because once you start doing that it will just keep suggesting them for you so it just kind of helps it takes the work out of it so I've just been trying to immerse myself every morning in a worship time. And I see them raising their hand, and it reminds me, oh, this is not just a song. This is an engagement with God. This morning, I was listening to something brand new uh, from uh, Chandler Moore, and he was, he was doing uh, uh, this a medley of songs, and in between, he was just praying. And I just put down my razor. Okay, God, do that for me. Yes, yes. That's, man, fill yourself like that. That's another part of prevention as well. So would you stand to your feet, everybody, if you're in the room? If you're online, 
man, stand to your feet too. Let's change your position. Let's get real. Let's get serious. Let's do this. Now, would you, would you bow your heads with me and let's pray? Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful that you came and you, you showed us your purpose, your intent. You want us to have a good life. You want us to have eternal life. You want us to have a healthy view of sexuality. And you want us to uh, use the gift and steward the gift you've given us in a, in a healthy way in your boundaries, which is one man married to one woman. And that's where sexual expression happens. That is your biblical plan. So, Lord, help us to stick within your plan. No matter how tempting the other thing sounds, we know it ends in death. So, Lord God, help us to fit within your plan. Help us to bend to you, not vice versa. Help us to come your way so that we have eternal life. Lord, remind us that the day of judgment is coming, not without warning. You've been talking about it for 2,000 years. Lord, help us to be ready for that day, that we would not be ashamed, but that we would just be able to present a life to you, lived as best we can, following you. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. So every eye bowed, every head bowed, every eye closed. And I'd like to just slowly look over the room and... If you would like prayer for this very area we're talking about today, would you just look up at me and make eye contact and then you just bow your head again. I've done this in other times, in other services, and I will just go and just make it a habit to pray for you. And some are already starting to do that. So uh, just look up at me now if that's you. Make eye contact. Good. And I'm just going to go slowly over the room. Men or women, it doesn't matter. I just want to pray for you. I just love that honesty. I pray for you. I care about you. I love you. And I'm a co-struggler. Thank you for that honesty. Boy, God can sure work with that. Online, I can't see you, but God can. Would you indicate to God that you want prayer for this too? And I'm going to include you in the prayer. Lord Jesus, we turn away from our sin, and we turn toward you. We want your best. We want eternal life. We want actions that lead to life and not death. So would you just repeat after me, Jesus? I turn away. I repent of lust. And I choose to follow you, to work within your boundaries, because I want life. I want your life. Lord Jesus, we do just repent. We turn away from those sins, Lord God. Uh, even, and I'm, I'm talking about people, uh, those of us who are Christians, or we, we say, we realize that's wrong. We don't want it in our lives. We turn away from it, and we purpose, Lord, to take the next step. So I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you show each person a next step, especially each person that looked up at me, would you help us to take another step? Because most likely, the steps we have taken have fallen a little short. So Lord God, help us to take another step. Help us to follow you wholeheartedly with everything that we got. Help us to take that step. In Jesus' name. With your head still bowed, one more invitation. And that's to the person who you, you're now currently walking in a relationship with Jesus. Do you know that your sin separates you from God? Picture being separated from God for eternity. That's what sin does. So you need a Savior, and Jesus is the Savior of the world. He is the hope of all the world. I want to invite you to, to confess your sins, to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to give your life to Him. Just turn away from your sin, turn your life over to Him, and let Him lead. You want to do that today? You want to become a Christian today? Give your life to Jesus today? Put your faith in him? If so, would you raise your hand right now? And I'm just looking around, just make sure I, I see everybody. I want to just pray for you like I've been praying for people today. Yeah, I see you. Good. Yeah, that's good. 
some of you, I think, just making sure you're really saved. And that's good. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. So would you all, online or in the room, just repeat after me, Jesus, I invite you, I welcome you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you starting now to be your apprentice forever. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. And if you did that today, we just applaud you. Whether you're in the room and you raised your hand, you made that decision, or if you're online, would you just right now, just pull out your phone so you don't forget, right now, text RESTART to the phone number 97000. That would just let us know you made that decision, and we could pray for you specifically about that. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Garen. We love you, Pastor Garen. Thank you so much. You know, it's, I think it's easy for a preacher to get up here and preach this message and keep it theoretical, keep it kind of abstract, because we don't really want to talk about it. But Pastor Garen brought a word that was so practical and gave us actual action steps to take, and you should take them. Absolutely take them. Oh, my God. We love you, Pastor. I know he's gone, but <laughs> we love him so much. Well, it was so good to see you today. If you are new, would you just text the word GREET to 97000 just so we can connect with you. We just the It's just the first saying hi, saying hi to you, and just so we can connect with you. Also, if you're watching us online, would you subscribe to our channel? I don't know exactly how it works, but somehow the, fa the, the YouTube algorithm, because people are subscribing, can share our videos with other people online so we can show how we're sharing Jesus growing together with a wider audience. And that's just a great way you can be a part too. Um, also, I want to remind you, connect groups are today after service and every week. So um, there's something for everyone right after service. Go get connected. It was so great seeing you this week. See you later.